Hi, thanks for the introduction and for inviting me um, to talk today in the Eco Art Tech Zoom Dialogue. Today I'll be talking about the sounds of space and in particular our art science collaboration, uh, which is a work that's ongoing with um, Diana Scarborough, who's going to talk to you more about the art aspects after my talk, and Kim Cuneo, who is a leading Australian composer and head of music at the Australian National University. I'll start the talk today by going into um, some background, telling you a little bit about the sounds, what they are, how we collect them, etc. And I'll follow that by playing some sample sounds uh, recorded by the VLF receiver at uh, Halley Base in Antarctica. And then I'll say a few words about some of our ongoing art science collaborations. Now, it turns out that our planet naturally produces a wide variety of radio emissions. And these radio waves are generated by two principal processes. They can be generated by lightning activity during thunderstorms and also during geomagnetic storms, which are ultimately driven by the sun. Now these radio signals can be best detected by large antennae, either in space or on the ground. Now, man-made radio waves are used to transmit information and are used for a variety of applications, including radio astronomy, satellite communications, mobile phones, GPS, Wi-Fi, VHF television, FM radio, and right down at the lowest end of the radio spectrum, below 10 kilohertz, is Earth's natural radio. Now the human ear responds to a similar range of frequencies, typically ranging from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And Earth's naturally occurring radio signals lie primarily within this audio frequency range. Now sound waves, of course, are vibrations of air molecules, but these emissions are a form of electromagnetic radiation, and so we cannot hear them directly. However, the recorded emissions can be converted to audio files and played back as sound. And this is what enables us to hear the sounds of space. The emissions can also be detected using a simple radio receiver and converted to sound waves using an audio amplifier. And these devices can be bought online for hundred pounds or so and allow anyone to go outside and listen to the sounds of space for themselves. Before I start introducing the sounds, I'd like to uh, briefly mention the Spectrum Analyzer. Now, this is a software tool that helps us visualize the audio signals by plotting the amplitude of the sound on a frequency versus time graph. Now, Halley Research Station, operated by the British Antarctic Survey, is an absolutely fantastic location to record the sounds of space because it is magnetically connected to the outer radiation belt where some of the radio waves are generated and it's also electromagnetically quiet being far from man-made sources. The receiver itself consists of two orthogonal 58 meter squared single loop antennae and it is designed specifically to detect the magnetic fluctuations of the earth's low frequency radio waves. The weak signals which it picks up are amplified, processed electronically, and then subsequently digitized at 96 kilohertz. At the British Antarctic Survey, um, scientifically, uh, we use our VLF ELF data recorded from Halley primarily to help us investigate the science of space weather storms, to understand space weather impacts on the Earth's climate system and also for lightning detection as part of a worldwide lightning detection network. And as a remarkable spin-off, the data can be converted directly to sound, revealing the mesmerizing and data-rich sounds of space. Now, the main signals a ground-based VLF receiver detects come from lightning activity. Each lightning flash emits a short radio pulse known as a spheric which covers a wide range of frequencies. 
And these are heard as short cracks and appear as vertical lines in a spectrogram. The spherics that we detect at Halley Base typically come from the Amazon and Congo basins, both of which are over 8,000 kilometers away. So let's listen to some spherics as detected by the VLF receiver at Halley Base. It turns out that spherics can travel even further, up to halfway around the globe. And when the signals do this, they become slightly distorted. These signals have a pronounced ringing nature and are known as tweaks. Some of the radio waves associated with lightning activity can leave the atmosphere and leak into space. Here, the signals can be guided by the Earth's magnetic field and received in the opposite hemisphere. They can also be reflected from the opposite hemisphere and detected in the same hemisphere as the original lightning strike. In this medium, higher frequency waves typically travel faster than lower frequency waves, and the received signal has a characteristic descending tone and are known as whistlers. Another very prominent signal type known as chorus, is generated deep within the Earth's magnetospheric cell. Energetic electrons enter the magnetosphere during geomagnetic storms driven by the sun, ultimately giving rise to the Earth's beautiful aurora and also generating chorus emissions. Now these waves tend to be strongest on the dawn side of the planet, typically at distances from four to nine Earth radii from the center of the Earth, as can be seen from the results of this statistical survey using data from seven satellites. And in this plot, the sun is at the top of the panel, dawn is to the right, and the plot scale extends linearly out to 10 Earth radii. And the intensity of the waves are color coded such that the strongest waves are coded red and the weakest waves are coded um, blue and black. Now, chorus is an important emission as it can accelerate electrons to very high energies in the Earth's outer radiation belt. And these so called killer electrons can damage satellites and pose a risk to humans in space. So we use models of chorus in our space weather models and forecasts. Now the most common form of chorus uh, recorded on the ground consists of a multitude of rising tones in the frequency range from one to five kilohertz. And these emissions are known as chorus because they often resemble the twittering of birds in the dawn chorus. Sometimes the signals are more widely spaced and can exhibit unusual complexity. This example shows some strong, rapidly rising tones. Plasmospheric hiss is another important magnetospheric emission. Unlike chorus, hiss is a broadband structureless signal and resembles audible hiss. Wow. 
sounds rather like distant traffic on a motorway. Now, plasmospheric hiss is also enhanced during storms, and these waves are strongest on the day side of the planet, typically at two to four Earth radii from the center of the Earth. Plasmospheric hiss is largely responsible for the slot region, but is often observed between the Earth's inner and outer radiation belt. Now, different types of signal often appear together in our VLF recordings. And at Halley, we tend to record one minute samples every 15 minutes. So this is a typical example of a recording from the VLF receiver at Halley. And this interval contains a medley of sounds comprising spherics, diffuse whistlers, rising chorus elements, and steady plasmospheric hiss below about two kilohertz. So take a careful listen and see if you can identify all of the signals that I have presented earlier. Just like to uh, share one more interval with you. This particular sample contains rising tone chorus, diffuse whistlers, and spherics. Plasmospheric hiss is also present below about two kilohertz, with an intensity that subtly waxes and wanes over a period of about four seconds, producing an eerie background breathing sound. It's just as if there is a monster watching us in the background. Moving on to our art science collaboration. Back in 2017, we set up a multidisciplinary art science collaboration to help us exploit these amazing natural sounds with the aim of making them more accessible to wider audiences and having a bit of fun at the same time. Since then, we have used the space sounds in performances, including animations, music, and contemporary dance, short films, and music. And Diana will talk more about this collaboration after my talk. In a separate collaboration, I work with Frontier Developments, a video gaming company, to incorporate the space sounds from Halley in the space simulation game, Elite Dangerous. In any one of over 400 billion stellar systems, players can use a new analysis mode to discover more about their surroundings. The new mode, called the Full Spectrum System Scanner, features the simulated sounds of radio emissions from exoplanets in remote stellar systems 
based on our Halley VLF recordings. So let's just play a few examples from the game. Finally, I'd just like to briefly talk about our latest work, Aurora Musicalis. In May 2020, we released a new album, Aurora Musicalis, which combines the sounds of space from the VLF receiver at Halley with original music. And this new work allows us to hear the sounds of space accompanied by Kim Cuneo's original music played on a grand piano. The complete 90 minute work reveals the diurnal variations of the audio frequency signals. The album, which is available on Bandcamp, comprises 11 tracks enabling the listener to experience the changing sounds throughout the day. A three minute compilation of the space sounds set to the music of the opening track and a beautiful music video featuring images from the Bass image collection. And we're very pleased to be able to let you know that music from our album has recently featured on a number of radio stations, including Manx Radio, Cambridge 105 Radio, Resonance FM and Skylab Radio, and also on a couple of ambient music playlists. So just in case you uh, would like some more information, I'll share this slide with you and you can look at this in more detail later. These are some useful uh, websites related to our project. And I'll just end up with the um, slide that I started with. And this has my email address on it as well. And anybody that's interested in collaborating uh, or asking me uh, further questions is welcome to get in touch with me at any time. Thank you for listening.